Well, good morning. Welcome. It is great to have you here this morning. Um, it really is nice to have at least a vague semblance of, of normal. Um, my name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC, and it is my privilege at this point to take us into God's Word. We think this is very important because uh, we believe the Bible is God's Word, and so we work hard to understand what it says and why it is um, relevant to us. I also want to say happy Father's Day to everyone. Um, for those of you who are out there watching us online, I am so sorry that you missed this. I just thought I would taunt you for a second. Um, I thought it was genius that we have tables set up to hand these out as people are walking in. Um, anyone else figure out that you could go to one table walk out and go to the other table, and they wouldn't know. Um, I'm going to turn this way. My doctor is that way, so we'll pretend that didn't happen. Now, I'll be good. I'll consider giving them back. We are going through the book of Romans, and uh, we have arrived at the very last part of chapter 8, and this represents a major, major division between 8 and 9 in the book of Romans. And um, we are going to look at Romans 8, 31 through 39, and what I would like to do this morning is start by just reading the passage and getting an overview of what Paul says here, because these are some of the most powerful, dynamic verses of Scripture that you will ever come across. What then shall we say to these things? Really, what are the these things? It's probably everything that he has said from chapter 1 up to this point. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Last week, we looked at a section of Romans 8 that's leading right up to this that talks about the suffering that we encounter. And there's an image that I used that I want to come back to this morning. It's the image of crossing a river. If you remember what I talked about is the Christian life can be understood as trying to walk across a river that has a strong rapid that's pushing against you, that threatens to knock you over, that threatens to take you off your feet. So often what we are tempted to do against that current is just to give up and stop crossing the river. We just want to get on a rock that's comfortable and stay there. But here's the thing. What crossing the river represents is what God is doing in our lives, what God wants for us, the, the thing that is absolutely best for us, and that is to make us more like Christ. And the promise that we saw last week is that a day is coming that we will get to cross that river. And the day is coming when we will stand in the presence of God and we will be completely and finally transformed into the exact image, the exact person that we were designed to be, the image of Christ. And our life as a Christian now is a life of becoming more and more like that as we move across the river. 
problem is, that river just keeps speeding against us. That, keep, that river just keeps hitting us with pain and fear. It hits us with opposition. It hits us with oppression. It hits us with the brokenness of a fallen world. And we have this fear inside of us as this happens again and again and again that God has abandoned us to a broken world and that ultimately always will result in self-centeredness. And isn't that what we see right now in our culture? Fairness is what we've always seen in our culture, but it's just screaming out at us. We look at injustice, we look at riots. We look at how people are treating one another online. We look at how, what politicians are doing. We look at celebrities. We look at the fact that baseball has not started yet. We look at what happens in our own churches and in our own families. And we see this self-centeredness that comes at the bottom of it all from this belief that God has left us on his own, and it is, all, it is up to us to care for ourselves. Well, what is our solid footing that keeps us moving across the river in the face of this current, in the face of the temptation to think that God has abandoned us? How is it that we should think rightly about what God thinks of us as we are trying to cross this river? And that is really the question that Paul is addressing as he wraps up the first eight chapters of Romans. And you'll notice that when we read through the chapter or read through this paragraph, he starts the paragraph with the comment, what shall we say about these things? And it's like he's taking all these eight chapters and he's bringing them together in this one final thought. It is the so what of Romans 1 through 8. It's why the gospel matters. Well, today's passage really divides into two sections. The underlying theme of all of it is the love of God. In verses 31 through 34, you have the love of God as seen in the work of Christ. And in verses 35 through 39, you have the love of God as seen in the love of Christ. And Paul is going to show us that we can know that God's love for us is absolutely unbreakable even as the current bounces us off of rocks. And he starts developing that thought in verses 31 through 34 by showing that the love of God is seen through the work of Christ. And he says, what shall we say then to these things? That's the so what. Why has all of this mattered? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is the first of three questions related to the issue of how we overcome condemnation, how we deal with condemnation, because we are always facing condemnation. And remember, again, what the context is. It's God making us like Christ. That's what he was just talking about in the passage. It is God working in our lives to make us more like Christ. And this is is what is, is being worked against in us. Who can be against us as God works to make us more like Christ? It is a general statement of opposition. It is every day the opposition that we face as we try to become more like Christ. It is the person who gossips to you and invites you into that because what they are doing is inviting you in to a life that is, is not like Christ. It is the advertisements that we see every single day that are constantly around us that tells us what we are to value and what makes us lovable that are so completely against everything that God has said about what makes you lovable and valuable. It is the person who wants you to support a judgmental remark that they are making on social media that tears someone down. It's a general level of opposition to our becoming more like Christ. But you'll see as Paul moves through this passage, he ratchets up the intensity. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect. This is now uh, a legal term that's being used here, and it's specifically the way it's written applies to a personal attack. It's like someone saying, I am going after you, and I'm taking you to court, and I'm going to charge you in that court. It's very personal the way this is written. 
This is the person in your life, the voices in your life that accuse you. These are the voices that say, look what you did. Shame on you. And then in 34, it gets ratcheted up even further. Who is to condemn? The image has moved to the courts, and now it's in the hands of the judge, and the, and the opponent wants the judge to find you guilty and to punish you. It's that voice that says, look what you did. Shame on you. God must reject you. God must be so disappointed in you. Who opposes us? Who accuses us? Who condemns us? Here's what I want you to understand. When Paul writes these things, he is not saying, well, no one does. The Romans could have put names to those questions. Who opposes you? I can tell you who opposes us. It's Caesar. Who accuses us? I can tell you who accuses us. It's all these people around me that keep going back to the officials and telling me, look, there are Christians there that you need to deal with. Who condemns us? It was their court system. They can put names to it. So can we. Because these things happen to us. Who opposes us? Sadly, it might be a fellow Christian who is trying to tempt you you into sin. Who accuses us? Sometimes it's the fellow Christian who disagrees with your political views and questions whether or not you can be a true Christian. Who condemns us? We've got cultural elites all around us. Tell us that what we believe is not just false, it is morally wrong. These are the currents that work against us. And Paul isn't saying that there is no opposition. He is saying that the opposition, the currents that, that work against us, cannot even, be, cannot even contend with the love of God. What shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? And then he answers that question in greater detail in verse 32. He who did not spare his own son. You see, Paul's fundamental answer to the question of how do we handle a world that condemns us, currents that oppose us, accuse us, and condemn us, is you look at the cross. God did not spare his own son. God gave him for us. And if God will do that, he will do everything, anything that we need to see us cross that river. This is not saying he will give us all successful businesses. He's not saying he will give us all straight A's. He's not saying he will give us all perfect marriages and perfect children. He is saying, remember the context, everything that you need to be like Christ, God will give you. When the world opposes you and invites you into sin, remember the incredible love of your heavenly father who sent his son to the cross. How do we answer? What do we say when we are accused? We remember it is God who justifies. When someone says to you, look what you did, shame on you, you must remember that God looks at you and says, look what Jesus did. Grace to you. What is the answer to condemnation? It's a cross. It's Christ who died. You see, condemnation refers to the judgment against us and to the penalty. And what is the penalty for sin? It is death. And what Paul is saying here 
is that Jesus has paid that penalty and he has now conquered death. And he now sits at the right hand of God. That's the seat of power. And he every day, all day, constantly is saying to God, this person is outside of condemnation because this person is a follower of me. He is your child. This person has had the penalty of their sin paid for by me. And that is the message that Jesus gives to our Heavenly Father every day, all day long. The currents that pound against you every day are strong and they will beat you up. People around you do not care about. And in fact, many people directly oppose you becoming like Christ. There are people around you who accuse you constantly by pointing out your failures. There are people around you who condemn you by saying you are not worthy of the very journey to be like Christ. And the answer to every one of those is the cross. The answer to every one of those is look at the cross. The cross is proof of God's love for you despite your failures, despite the fact that you are not worthy. Because it's never been about you being worthy. It's about Jesus being worthy on your behalf. It is proof that becoming like Christ is becoming like the greatest and most selfless love that has ever walked this earth. No one who opposes you, who accuses you, who condemns you, can separate you, can drive a wedge between you and the love of God. And by the way, Probably the person who does that to you the most is you. Probably the person who does that to you the most is you when you sit down and say to yourself, look what I did, shame on me. God must think I'm a total loser. Paul is wrapping up, he's saying... Everything that I have said about the depth of our sin, the depth of our struggle, has been followed by the wonder of God's grace by sending Jesus to die on the cross, to raise him from the dead. And we are united with him in his death and resurrection. And he's saying all of that comes down to this point. Even when you condemn yourself, the answer is not guilty. Paul then goes on to talk about another way of looking at that current. Are these things that happen in our lives signs that God has stopped loving us? These, these calamities, these tragedies, these struggles, these fears. And Paul is going to answer that question next. What about the events of life that threaten to, separation, to separate us from God's love? And what Paul does is he points to the love of Christ as a sign of God's unfailing, unbreakable love. Now, he does this by giving us seven, di seven different things that we might look at and say, if these things are happening to me, then maybe God has stopped loving me. Maybe God has abandoned me. Maybe God has turned against me. And he's going to address every one of those. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to walk through them, but the details of them actually is not Paul's point. We could spend a lot of time talking about the details, but even though I'm going to give you some details, you can then ignore them. Tribulation. The word that's used there has the idea of something that is life-crushing. Distress. Those things in life that cause us stress. Persecution. Use a word that's popular now. This is systemic oppression. Famine. Any natural disaster. Nakedness sounds weird to us. Um, 
Well, it does in a lot of ways. Um, but why would he include that? What, what he's actually doing there is he's referring to the lack of the most basic care that we need. It's the lack of, of having your fundamental needs being met. Danger. Threats that we anticipate that haven't happened yet but are coming. And sword is actually a reference to the government's ability to punish. And specifically, probably capital punishment. Because the sword was what was used for capital punishment on Roman citizens. So he's talking about even if the government is against you. And Paul's point here isn't so much about these seven things. His point is that anything, any situation that you can think of that might look like it's a, it's a defeat, that might look like it's separating you from God, any of it is nothing compared to God's love. Now, verse 36 also seems weird, but what Paul is doing is actually intensifying what he's just said. He's just listed these seven things that we look at and say, yeah, I can understand why someone would think that God doesn't love me. And verse 36 is actually an intensifier of that. Because what he's doing is he's quoting part of Psalm 44. And here's what's going on in Psalm 44. Israel has just suffered a significant military defeat at the hands of their enemies, and they literally were getting slaughtered all day long. And here's the other part of Psalm 44 that's really fascinating, that tends to go against how we think about God. Part of what Israel says in Psalm 44, which apparently was true, is, God, we did nothing wrong. We were faithful to you. We were faithful to your covenant. We, we have been the people that you've wanted us to be, but we are getting slaughtered all day long. It is, an, it is an anguishing cry, a complaint that God has allowed his people to suffer a devastating and, humility, and humiliating defeat despite their faithfulness. And God's people cry out, why have you abandoned us when we have done nothing wrong to deserve it? And Paul is saying that these exact sorts of things are happening to the Romans and they are happening to us. Does that mean that God has stopped loving them or has abandoned us? And Paul emphatically answers that question with some of the most powerful verses in the Bible that you will ever encounter. No isn't just a casual no. The way this is written in Greek is very intense. Not a chance. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. That's a really hard concept to translate into English. The idea is we are massively victorious. Walk onto a football field and see the Longview Lobo football team, it would be intimidating and it would be impressive. Until you put them on a football field with the Dallas Cowboys. The Cowboys would blow them away. It would not even be a contest. The margin of victory would be so huge, it's like there wasn't a game at all. And that is what these words are saying. We are more than conquerors, like the cowboys destroying the Longview Lobos. Which I feel bad about for the Lobos. All of these things that Paul has listed, these are things in life that, that we can look at and say these could completely derail us. But all of these things that he's listed are things that Paul says, God just blows them away with his love. And Paul makes this comment, he uses this little word right here at the beginning of verse 38. I am sure, this idea of sure is an absolute certainty, no question at all that nothing can separate us from God's love. And Paul makes the point by giving another list. And once again, the point is not in the details, but I'm going to give you some details. The point is the fact that 
everything is covered. He says that neither death nor life, any mode of existence that you can think of, everyone is one of those two. You're either dead or you're alive. Even zombies. Angels nor rulers. These are all possible authorities that you could think of. Things present nor things to come. These are all possible circumstances that we face now or could face. Powers refers to spiritual authorities. Very often they would have thought of of evil spiritual influences or those that are being influenced by them. Height nor depth in that culture, that was kind of a, a, a slang way of talking about huge obstacles that would defeat just any normal person. You think of someone from that time period trying to, to scale Mount Everest and they would say it's just not possible. Someone from that time period trying to swim to the bottom of the ocean and it's just not possible. Just any major obstacle that they could think of. And then just to make sure that he's covered everything, anything else in all creation. In other words, everything that isn't God. Nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will be able to separate you. And that statement summarizes this passage in the entire book of Romans so far. God can be known. His love can be experienced only through the love of Jesus Christ and only through his death and resurrection. And because of Jesus' death and resurrection, God's love for you is unbreakable. Because I like charts... I wanted to take verses 35 um, and 37 and, and kind of mash them up into one chart that helps us get our mind around what Paul is saying are the obstacles, the things that oppose us, accuse us, and condemn us in our walk with Christ. And I've taken these things, and I won't go through this in detail. I just want to point out that I think they group together in five different categories. Right? We have the painful circumstances of our past and our present. We have the anticipated circumstances, things that we look at and say, if this happens, I will be undone. We have oppressive authorities. We have just the general fallen world that's characterized by sickness and death. We have spiritual opposition that actively works against us becoming like Christ. My challenge for you is to look at these categories. All of these kind of describes where I am struggling to believe that God really loves me. Am I experiencing painful circumstances now or when I look back at my past and wonder, God, how can you allow me to go through that if you love me? When I look at what might be coming, does it cause you to me? When I look at how I'm being treated by people who are in authority over me, when I'm dealing with death and illness, decay, even my own spiritual struggles, spiritual opposition that I face. And if you're wondering how you can tell which one of these that you struggle with, let me give you some ideas. Look at how you treat other people. Look at what you're afraid of. Look at what you are terrified to lose. Look at what makes you over the top angry. You see, those are all pinpointing things that you are afraid if you don't have. That it's a sign 
that you are not loved and that you are not safe. If you're afraid that this country is going to slip into anarchy, what does that reveal to you about your view of God's love for you? So what if it does? Yeah, that would be horrible. It would be horrible. And God will love you. And God will not stop pursuing your best. What if you are constantly trying to fill a void in your heart through gossip, through putting other people down? What does that reveal to you about what you think of God's love for you? Does it reveal that you think God's love for you is inadequate? Does it reveal that that you have to take it upon yourself to build yourself up in certain ways because God's love for you just isn't a sure thing? What if you're constantly nitpicking to make yourself feel important or because you're never satisfied with anything? What does that reveal about your view of God's love for you? That things have to be absolutely perfect. Things have to be just your way for your world to be okay. I've alluded to this, but probably the one I hear the most is look at what I have done. They fear that they are one part of creation that this passage doesn't apply to. The proof of God's unbreakable love for you is Christ. Jesus on the cross is proof that no one is going to convince God not to love you. Jesus' willingness to go to the cross for you is proof that no circumstance will keep God from loving you. And it is the evidence that he has never for one second stopped loving you. I want to tease out two principles from this passage that I think are really important. The first principle is this. It is the truth about God's love for you. And the truth about God's love for you is that his love is unstoppable. It is unbreakable. God's love for you will never end. God's love for you will never be turned aside or distracted by something else. God's love for you will never meet an obstacle it cannot overcome. God's love for you will never face opposition it cannot defeat. God's love will never ever be called into question. God is never going to sit back and say, I really regret loving that person. God's love is the love that you have been searching for your entire life. It is the love that you search for when you try to prove yourself to others. It is the love that you are searching for when you try to make yourself out to be more than who you are. It is the love that you are searching for when those closest to you let you down and disappoint you and wound you. It is the love that you are searching for when your heart silently cries out, I want to be known for who I am and loved. I don't want to have to hide these things about me. I don't want to fear rejection. I want to be seen for who I am and embraced and I fear it will never happen. And what Paul is saying in these verses is it is happening right now in your life. That is the truth of God's love. It is unbreakable. The truth about our love for others is that it is profoundly and easily breakable more than we want to admit. I was working through this passage the other day and it almost drove me to tears as I thought about this. I just had to stop and vent to myself. See, the way that God loves us is the way that we are supposed to love one another. And I was hit hard by how much I fall short. God never, ever takes advantage of people, but I do. God never gives up on people, but I do. God never and will never say, I just don't have it in me today to be available to this person, to love this person, but I do. 
Do you realize that God has looked at every rioter that has been burning buildings? Every one of them. And in every moment, every second has said, I love you. I want to be near you. I want what is best for you. Every one of them. Do you realize that God has looked at every abusive police officer or other person in authority and has said, what you did was wrong, and I want to be your loving father? Do you realize how differently God looks at the person in this church that you are upset with and wondering, how can you keep your distance from that person? Because God wants to draw closer to them and do what he can for their good. As you come more and more to grips with the vastness of God's love, the more you will repent of your love or lack of love for other people. The currents that push against you are going to hit you hard. Sometimes they're going to bounce you off some rocks. And the question that is going to ring in your ear in that moment has to do with what does this say about my relationship with God and where God is? And Paul's answer, Paul's direction for you in those moments is to look at the cross. Look at the work of Christ and know that no opposition can overcome God's love for you. Look at the love of Christ and know that no situation will overcome God's love for you. And that is Paul's point in this passage, and really all the way through the first eight chapters of Romans. God's love for you is unbreakable. And the implication for me in my life has been, this past week, when I see what God's love is like, it convicts me of how far short my love falls. So I need to examine how I love. God's love is the love that you have searched for your whole life. It is the love that you are to reflect to every single person in this room and every single person outside this room. Getting to the other side of the river means becoming a person who consistently loves like God. How do we take steps towards that? Four suggestions. Again, get the scripture deeper, deeper into your soul. Rewrite it. Think through it. Pursue a conversation with someone who's outside your circle. It's easy to do this with people that we're already close to. What about the person that you've been disagreeing with on Facebook or other social media? Can you invite them for coffee, get together? Pick up the phone and call. Don't talk about what you're disagreeing about. Just get to know them. Confess where you doubt God's love. Every one of us does. Every one of us has areas where we question God's love. Confess it and ask the Holy Spirit for assurance. And here's one that's going to be very hard for you, but I believe it is for some of you. For some of you, it'll be very easy. Um, Fast. Not talking about from food. I'm talking about from social media. Just for a week. Fast from social media. Why? Because I'm convinced that there are probably very few things in our culture right now that are undermining our ability to show God's love for one another as much as social media. And I've talked to two or three different people this past week who have said, I'm just off social media for a while. And what every one of them has said is, it, it is making a profound difference in how I relate to people. Because I'm not bitter. I'm not angry. See if it makes a difference. We desperately, desperately need the assurance 
the stability, the foundation that someone looks at us, sees us, and loves us. And Paul has said, that is who your God is. Would you stand with me and close in prayer as we thank God for loving us like that? Heavenly Father, we come before you and we cannot get our minds around how it is that you love us, the depth of your love for us, the the unfailing nature of your love, because we don't love that way. All of the pictures of love that we have in our lives are limited. They fail us. They let us down. And so we cannot even fathom what it is to be loved by someone who is not limited, who never fails us, and who will never let us down. Who always pursues being close to us. Who always pursues what is good for us. And we thank you, Lord, that that is how you love us. And we thank you that we have tangible proof of it. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we doubt you, the times that we doubt your love, and and we do it every single day. Lord, forgive us that we have so little faith in your character and your love. And Lord, we thank you that you do forgive us. And that you look at, at our lack of faith and our weakness, and you say, that's why I sent my son. Because I love you. And because you struggle in faith. And because you're weak. Thank you, Lord. Lord, our assignment is to reflect your love. And we do so very imperfectly. Lord, help us to do that better. By understanding your love a little bit better this week. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's what we've said about God, and I'm just going to quote the verses. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us, separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So your charge here is to leave here Just like Paul said, certain, no doubt that that is true. And then to go reflect that to a world that is searching for it. You are dismissed. Prayer team will be out by the desk um, in the lobby. If you need to pray with someone about any issues, we would love to pray with you.